Hello, everybody. This is, I'm Katie Segal, and I'm Kurt Sutter. And we are uh, doing an episode of Slice of Pie, which... What is Slice of Pie? It's when the fans, our fans, get to ask uh, questions, and we will try to be honest and answer them. Uh, yes, I forget. Um, well, I'm sure some, um, somewhere, uh, as we do this, it'll inform you as to where those questions might be sent, but, um, uh, but yet yeah, we are, uh, doing a little Q and A and, uh, and whatever it else it is that we do here, um, on pie people. Influences. Experiences. That's right. We're so fucking lame. We're having a lot of fun doing this. Don't you think, honey? Oh Yeah. That did not sound as sincere as I know uh, he means. No, we are having fun. We've, we've, you know, we haven't worked together in a, in a minute, so it's fun. I know, and we've learned so much about how to do that in a um, constructive and where am I just, going? I don't just know for the I'm record, going. neither it's one actually... of us are professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Anything we say, we are. I'm declaring that we um, we're pretty much just winging it. And we have learned through the book of life, which actually I think that's an actual book, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, through our experience, but we are not professionals in any way when it comes to people and influences and experiences. Well, podcasting. Yeah. Right. Or in any field whatsoever. No, no. People you, seek out. <laughs> you are seriously a professional. In in, uh, in in people, influences, and experiences? Really? Well, as a writer, I would say yes. Ah, I think that Human that nature. Is, yeah, it's part of the experience right. of- I'll know, give you that one. As an actor, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I have to be observational. Um, yeah. All right. All right. That's enough of us. Okay. Let's hear the questions. What are we answering today? All right. The first one is from your email. It's from Steve Steven. It's a long one, so get ready. Oh, God, the last, Stephen. <laughs> the last few months of my life have been immensely difficult. I have Oof. suffered from depression and anxiety most of my life. I'm in a much better place. Despite this progress, I still feel partially incomplete. To use an analogy, I feel like I've used all the pieces in a puzzle box, but I'm left with an unfinished image. Kurt, from years of following your writing and listening to your interviews, you seem to be familiar with this struggle. What were some of the things that were helpful to you as you were starting to emerge from this emotional abyss? Is there something that you still struggle with today? And to Katie, what advice would you give to a significant other of someone who deals with mental health issues? I'm sure your insight will be a real help to many people who feel like they can't be a support or who feel completely hopeless. Thank you both for all the years of entertainment and for being examples of complete dedication to their respective crafts. Wow. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Now I kind of feel like a dick for making fun of you at the start. Um, and again, just to qualify, neither one of us really uh, professionals in that area, but... Uh, I, here's, uh, and I appreciate that. And, uh, and yes, I, uh, I'm familiar, uh, with that, uh, uh that struggle. Uh, but in case you haven't noticed, there are so many pieces to this puzzle that are still missing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like entire sections, but, um, to that point, I believe that it is always a, uh, journey it is always um uh we're all we're all on a on a on a on a, on a journey and that goes after neil brennan um never mind uh we uh uh we are never complete is what i'm basically what i'm saying uh my every time i start putting pieces back in one area i'll suddenly realize that there's another area that's missing pieces. And, and, uh, uh, I think the, the success of it all is continuing with the process and knowing that shit's going to change and that you have to, uh, accept and, uh, and adjust and, uh, and move through that stuff is, 
is how I get through it. Um, we've openly shared about our uh, recovery journey, and that's for us. Uh, most of those tools come from that arena, but uh, there are so many tools available to help people through that uh, process of putting themselves back together. Um, but that's what I would say is that it don't, uh, in my opinion, the puzzle's never complete, nor should it be. Katie? Um, yes, I agree with that. I think that that's part of what we're here for is to have things fall apart and then put them back together. I think that's how we, as humans, learn and grow. Um, in in relation to your question about how I have how how to live with people that are going through those struggles, which I also want to say I have gone through those struggles myself. So Kurt could probably answer this question as well. But for me, the biggest and hardest uh, and most valuable lesson I've learned is to not take things personally is to really understand that your partner is on their own, I'm going to say it again, journey, and that it doesn't necessarily, the discomfort of uh, one's partner is not is not reflective of what um, your own life is. So, I mean, it's really detachment. It's just knowing uh, what, what, what is, is what pertains to you, if some of it does, and hoping that that person will tell you that. And I, my biggest um, default is always trying to uh, figure out what other people are thinking without them telling me what they're thinking, because I sort of had to do that as a kid. I had to sort of figure out, I had to read the room so, because nobody was really telling me what was happening. So it's still something I try to do. But what I've learned now and what I'm always learning is when somebody tells you they're okay and they don't want to talk about it, and even though you have a sense like, oh, something's not okay, you just take them at their word and realize that um, whatever's going on will be revealed to you if, if need be and be loving, be supportive, and get on with your own life. That's really what I've learned. And um, you know, because we're individuals and it's hard sometimes when you're in a marriage or long-term relationship to, to remember that we're, we're not one. We are full people and then the marriage is one. Does that make sense? Wow. Th thank Such you, deep Stevie. questions. I'm always, I always get confused. I used to get really confused with these kind of questions when I was on when I was on Married with Children, I would get all these like politically correct kind of questions like, how can you say that about, how can you be on a show that is so sexist and blah, 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 blah. And they'd, they'd ask me all these sort of political references. And I would always get like, look, I'm just an actor and I'm reading my lines and I'm being funny. This does not mean it's my point of view. So sometimes you know, questions like this, which are fantastic, I, I just really want to couch that we are not professionals at any of the self-help arena. We are actually people that have had self-help issues. Uh, I want to thank Claritin for sponsoring this episode and providing us with samples. Y yes, which I really need. Springtime is here and everywhere I travel, my I, my allergies are alive and well. So luckily for those of us with symptoms like mine, we can use live Claritin Clear with Claritin D. And this, uh, this part is very important, so I'm going to speak in a different voice, which is designed for serious allergy sufferers, Claritin D, not to be confused with regular Claritin, Claritin D, um, uh, has two powerful ingredients in just one pill. Let me say that again. Two powerful ingredients in just one pill that relieve your allergy symptoms and decongest your nose so you can breathe easier and better. Uh, I have used Claritin in the past. I have... Uh, uh, With success? Yeah. Yeah. It's I, my experience was um, that I, I, di I didn't, I was having these headaches. I didn't know they were headaches. I mean, I mean, I didn't know they were sinus headaches. And then once I figured out they were sinus headaches, I 
took Claritin, and I didn't take it all that long period of time, but it did uh, it did clear up my sinus headaches. Fast and powerful relief is just a quick trip away. Find Claritin D at the pharmacy counter and ask for Claritin D when you're there. You don't even need a prescription. Here's what I would tell you to do. I think you should go to Claritin.com right now for a discount so you can live Claritin clear. Use as directed. <laughs> this next question is from Sybil. Katie, throughout your career, you've played vastly different roles, such as a computerized home that comes to life in physical form to a one-eyed human mutant captain of a ship. Gemma Tellermoro is such a complex and multifaceted character in Sons of Anarchy. How did you approach bringing such a strong woman to life on screen? And were there any particular challenges or moments that stood out to you during your portrayal of her? Well, I will say the first thing I'll say to that is she was very well written and which is more than half the, 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 the deal. So there, I was given a lot by Kurt. Kurt has a way of building a world where before you even open your mouth, you, he, he gave us all our backstories, basically where we came from, how we grew up, what our, you know, this is all stuff nobody saw in the series, but as actors, it filled us all up with, with why we are the way we are. So, um, to answer your question, yeah. And then you do your own personal work and to kind of, you know, find, find what pieces of your own life can kind of relate to the pieces of a person that you have no experience of being. So there's all that that's combined. And, um, but, you know, fortunately, uh, and, and this does not happen in every situation, but fortunately, um, the writer made it very easy to do our jobs. And it was also, I believe the entire show was cast really well. And I, I say that, you know, not giving myself kudos and pats on the back, even though I thought I was very appropriately cast, but I think everybody was. And that is, that's another huge piece of it. You know, it's really how you start the whole situation. So this one is from Elaine. My question, how did you survive the ups and downs of working together as a married couple, as two people starring in SOA, as two people in recovery, et cetera? How did it shape your relationship and what input would you give to other artists on the same path? First of all, we were, I, I think we were actively looking for something to do together. Um, we thought it would be fun. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've shared this before, but the role of Gemma was initially not quite as instrumental in the mythology. In that, I I my my original conception was more like a like the Nancy Marchand character in The Sopranos, that she was a more looming in the shadows, impacting everybody. And it was really John Langrath who wanted to play out the trilogy uh, of the Hamlet, uh, uh, or bring that more front and center. And, and ultimately in uh, the, at least, um, uh, by the third or fourth draft of the script addressed that and Gemma became a primary, more of a primary character. Uh, uh, so we did, you know, we were in the throes of, of, of full-time working together and, um, we had we had some bumps. We had to create some uh, boundaries. Um, uh, I'll share one, which was, uh, you know, like it's very it's interesting. We're here now in Calgary, and we're working on this Netflix show, and um, and I, in Kate's, you know, uh, not you know, uh, not uh, part of the you know this process, and and so she gets to just sort of see me do my job. And I think it's and not that she wasn't aware of this, but when you're from the outside looking in, I think she has a sense of the, how do I say this without sounding like I'm overburdened, but there's a lot of shit to do. And, and what happens is my cup already, like I wake up with my cup at least half full 
every day. So that cup gets filled up pretty quickly. And, uh, and there were a couple of times early on when we, uh, you know, I, I think there was a script issue. I think there was something that was not clear to her or she didn't understand or felt like there wasn't, you know, th things weren't being addressed. And I, you know, I remember clearly in that moment going, oh, this is, this would, this is going to blow us up. Right. And so what we learned is we love what we do. There's no way we're not going to come home and we're going to come home and not talk about our day because that's what people do. But in terms of the show, in terms of problems or issues or concerns, there is a crew of people who can navigate and take care of those things who are not me. And that was sort of our first lesson. And we did. We, we, we went to our therapist and we're like, all right, we need some boundaries. And, uh, and really did. And, and then it became once we, you know, once we, I found the groove of the show, once the motor, you know, the gears were turning and I knew the rhythm, we kind of had a sense of what that was. Then I think it became easier and uh, even to the point of enjoyable. Uh, um, would you say so? Wow. I would say quite a few things. First of all, I just want to say I'm in here. I'm here in Calgary with Kurt and I'm I'm being his partner, which is really an amazing thing. Not, not his work partner. I'm being his wife. And he is right to see him. I, I highly suggest this to anybody. Go to work with your husband and be impressed and realize how hot he is. <laughs> Because that's what, that's my experience. It's like seeing him, you know, out of his pajamas in his real clothes <laughs> at the office, at work and realizing, oh my God, this guy is amazing. <laughs> um, but to answer the first question about how did we navigate all that, I want to say that, you know, I think it's a matter of, and I think we did pretty well with this once we started is keeping everything right sized. And some of that is uh, um, recovery based, you know, as people that have, have come from being broken toys, as I like to say, to putting the pieces back together, we know what our priorities are. Ultimately, our priorities are our mental health and recovery. And then our priorities are our children and and taking care of them. Our priority is our marriage. And then the other piece of the pie is our job. And so for me, as just a piece of it, it I think it was easier for me to keep those things in balance, where now when I see when actually what Kurt does on a daily basis, I can see where he could get a little out of balance. And so, but I think at, at both of our cores, and it's kind of what our relationship was always based on was keeping the priority, what we know to be, which is not what we do. It is basically, um, who we, who, who we are and, and what's really important and what our primary purposes really are. So that to me, you know, once we got over sort of the initial excitement of, oh, you know, which was great, was absolutely great. But then the day to day of it, I think for me, was about keeping everything right sized and in balance and in and, and also learning to keep my mouth shut. That was, you know, still my struggle. But, you know, I, I'm trying to learn how to not have a thought and let it come out of my mouth immediately, especially when I'm talking to the boss. He's the boss, which is kind of hot, too. Sorry, just going on and on anyway. Okay, this one's from Fabiola. Hi, Katie. Hi. Are there any mainstream uh, contemporary artists you currently enjoy? And if so, who are they? I just want to add, I think you guys would really dig the new Beyonce album. And I even <laughs> feel like Katie could do some killer covers of a few songs from Cowboy Carter. I will agree. I, I thought her covers on that record, I thought the Jolene cover is great. And I also think the Blackbird cover is great. And... um. Yeah, I liked a lot of that record. I do. I listened to the whole thing. Um, contemporary artists that I really listen to, I don't. Um, 
I'm sort of, what do I listen to that's contemporary that I like? I mean, my, my kids turn me on to some stuff. I like, um, I like sort of Americana Rudy music, but I do, I like Angel Olsen. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows who she is, but I'm sure you do. I'm sure she's a big indie artist that, um, who do I like contemporary wise? You know, Kurt's probably the better person to, um, ask that question. Phoebe Bridgers grow up. <laughs> yeah. We watched Phoebe grow up in our kitchen because she, she was friends with our son with Jackson. We used, you know, from busking on the side st on the street with a little, you know, give me some money. But you know, it's interesting. I haven't listened to Phoebe now as much as I listened to her when she was 16 and she was amazing then. So I'm sure she's, um, and I've listened some to the ba the band she was, what's the band she's in? Boy Genius. Boy Genius. I'm, I'm, I like Boy Genius. I like Phoebe. I hope Phoebe does some solo Phoebe. Um, but yeah, I listen to contemporary music. I can't give you the names of everybody because I don't, I don't really, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to answer it. Lately, I've been listening to Lucinda Williams, like old Lucinda Williams. That's what I've been listening to. And, and old Emmy Lou and old, like I listen to, you know, Rodney Crowell and, and Emmy Lou Harris singing duets. And yeah. so, and I listen to, you know, um, Towns Van Sant. So I, I that's kind of where I'm at right now. That's what I've been listening to a lot lately. I know music means a lot to both of you. If you had to pick three of your favorite albums, what would they be? I bet I know one of yours. Yeah. I don't know if I can three. I mean, here's the thing. My, my songs, my albums... They all in my movies. They always they always change, uh, and it's all sort of where what what I'm influenced by, where I'm at, uh, and the same goes. So what might be true today may not be true uh, tomorrow or a, a year from now. Um, I can tell you uh, that one of my favorite albums is uh, probably the. Uh, least uh, popular, but one that's a little bit more off the grid uh, is uh, Springsteen's Nebraska, which uh, which he recorded. Uh, I, the lore is that he recorded it in a hotel room on a TX Taz cam um, and laid down all the tracks himself. And uh, um, I'd already, it's interesting, I grew up in Jersey, but I was not, uh, you know, I was in a, I was like a hair band dude in in high school, like like the, like a Skinner and Kansas and, uh, uh, you know, and that and that ilk. And then I didn't really get into singer songwriter or lyrics of it all until uh, I was in, you know, my early twenties, and and that's sort of when I plugged into Bruce. But I plugged into Bruce really through that album. There was something about that album. There was a, a lost quality and a um uh i remember my sister used to call it prison music <laughs> and, and it essentially to a certain extent is but there's a an echo of desperation in, in that album and those lyrics are all they're, they're like magicals they're they're all lovely and be beautiful as as are you know uh greetings too greetings were uh, uh his first album was was very much poems um but uh but nebraska really uh plugged me into a, an, a point of view about music that i really hadn't or an angle into music through words that i hadn't had before and then through that discovered him and then really the world of troubadours opened up uh, that's when i just in my early 20s i discovered weights you know, I discovered um, Leonard Cohen, like all of all of those amazing lyricists, Dylan, like all of those guys, um, and really influenced and changed my musical taste. And uh, so there's one album. I come from the era when you'd buy an album and you'd listen to the whole thing and then you'd know all the words. So Joni Mitchell Blue, Aretha Franklin, Spirit in the Dark, Blind Faith. Um, I'm going to say, uh, 
uh, Humble Pie. These are old bands. I don't know if anybody knows these bands. Traffic, which was Stevie Winwood first band. Laura Nero, probably going to take a miracle, which she did with Patti LaBelle. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the, I'm sure if you, I'm sure if you're a huge Taylor Swift fan, you listen to the entire Taylor Swift CD, whatever record, and you know all the words. I, that's not my experience right now, but those records, you know, I would throw in some Junior Parker records and some Muddy Waters records. I grew up listening to blues music. Robert Johnson was the first, you know, this friend of mine in high school sat down and played me all these blues. He was a guitar player and he played me, you know, Robert Johnson records and Muddy Waters records. And, you know, so it kind of spans, you know, a lot of different um, eras then. So I can't really, you know, and then there's Tom Petty. I mean, I could go on and on about, you know, whole albums that I really uh, loved and still do. Al Green, Let's Stay Together. I mean, come on. Now, if I'm totally dating myself and you're a whole bunch, you know, all you youngins out there, just go get those records. I'm telling you, it's a whole, um, you know, and you realize how young everybody was when they wrote those songs. It's it's pretty impressive. What was a James Taylor album with? Um, uh, Fire and Rain? Yeah, Fire and Rain. I forget. Yeah, like that's, that's an amazing record. lyric. I mean, those, it's an amazing album as well. All right, let's wrap this episode up with a voicemail. Hi, I'm a big fan of you guys and excited for the podcast, Pi. I was just wondering, with you guys being such an awesome couple, with your careers, family, and everything, do you guys set aside a date night for just the two of you? And whether you do or don't, do you recommend couples should? Um, just kind of curious what your input is on it. I have Thanks. a lot of input on it. <laughs> I, we, we have discussed this many times. And, and we have sworn to ourselves we're going to do it, and then we don't do it. And, I, you know, we spend a lot of time together. We're, we're together a lot. Like, we're the family that eats dinner together every night. You know, we have our 17-year-old, and, you know, we just, we're together a lot. But I was thinking, and I haven't spoken to him about this yet, that I soon would love to implement the, like, both get dressed up you know, go someplace nice, just the two of us, not be on our phones. It's a dream, but maybe it will happen. <laughs> but I think date night is important. Yes. If that's the question, yes. And do we do it? Mm, not so much. <laughs> but anyway, what I, I can't wait to hear what Kurt has to say. I'm sorry. Was there a question? <laughs> um. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, here's my feeling. I feel like uh, the pandemic bought me date night for the next three and a half years. <laughs> day like in, pajama paint day pandemic. night, day out. Oh, you're still here. Oh, we can't. Oh, we're here. Oh, yeah. I feel like uh, that was that was at least a couple years worth of date nights. <laughs> <laughs> No, she's right. She's right. Yeah, and and most of it, I will take. You know, I I I, I do this thing. I, I don't. You know, I don't like people. I don't like to leave the house and blah blah blah. And some of that is 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 true, but it, it's not. Uh, I I do like people. I like people in small doses, one on one. Uh, I do enjoy getting away leaving my space, discovering new space. Um, but, um, uh, it is, uh, you know, I am the, uh, probably uh, a lot of it is, is my control stuff, right? I, I, if, uh, my Katie can attest to this at one point, uh, having the misfortune of being my assistant, uh, that I am a bit of a control freak. They're Katie. It's not yeah, this yes, Katie. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Even though I can probably testify to the yeah, same, yeah. but go ahead. Uh, Katie Kurtwright, <laughs> yes. Um, that, uh, you know, I will, I mean, I can, I, I literally almost have like every hour of my day blocked out. And I kind of have to do that because it relieves my anxiety. Even if I don't, even if I don't do one thing that I've listed, I kind of have to do that. And, and as a result of that, 
when somebody says to me, hey, should we go to the movies? It feels like somebody is saying, hey, should we take off a year, change our names, get new IDs and, you know, like leave the country? It just sounds, God, what? Well, I, I have a solution. I'm sorry, I didn't mean, am I interrupting? Were you done? You, you interrupt me? Never. Here's my solution. I think that I should be on that schedule. That like, you know, so it doesn't feel like you uh, are. Well, I know I'm on- 11 minutes every morning, <laughs> two and a half minutes after lunch and a whole 27 minutes, you know, in uh, after dinner. So you're all over that calendar, baby. He's not. I think I should. Well, that that would be my suggestion is that I get a little alarm set on the phone too, you know, for date night just mm-hmm. once a week. Here's what I'll say to all the guy folk listening. Um, date night is is uh, is probably a very valuable tool in a relationship, one that I do not uh, pick up often enough. And I don't just say that to buy good faith or, you know, to avoid <laughs> what's going to happen like next. Staring at you across um, the table. It is. It is. It's. It, it is a way of you know. Because our lives are, uh, look, uh, everyone has uh, has a full plate, and it is a that kind of world right now. And uh, no matter what you do, and and sometimes the uh, relaxation or the R and R component always feels like work or too much work. And uh, and sometimes whatever the date looks like, it's good to just as as you mentioned, Katie, to put down the device, look the person in the eye, and at least acknowledge the fact that you, uh, you know, that you are in something other than uh, the day-to-day of, of the, you know, the throes of errands or the throes of tasks, that there is something beyond that. And, uh, uh, and it's hard, man. It's, it's, it's hard when you're, you're juggling a lot of shit. So, um, um, it doesn't have to be, in my opinion, uh, it doesn't have to be a lot. It just, there just has to be an effort and acknowledgement so that people know they, uh, they it's matter. Important. Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, we just wake up and we'll go grab coffee together and Kurt will call that a date night. And I, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll at times acquiesce and say, yeah, okay. But, um, no, I do think, um, uh, I think. I think what would make me very happy, and I know my husband likes to make me happy, is, um, you know, some some time unplugging, really not looking at devices and not, you know, answering emails and not doing that and just spending some, you know, it's like what they say when you're raising your children. And I learned this early on with my kids when I would come home from work and I, I think a therapist told me, look, they just need a half hour of undivided attention. They really need that. So it means coming into the house and putting the phone down and really focusing on the, the most important part of your life, which is really the people you love. I mean, at the end of the day, that is, that's, that's what there is. I think you treat your partner the same way. That's my thought. I also feel like I've done a lot of work on me in the last two years that benefited us. Absolutely. So, so that's what I've figured out over the, in the last few years is that, yeah, there's work on the thing that you're in, but it's what I realized. <laughs> the, the marriage. The marriage, the thing, the thing that's, you know, that is a part of the triangle. And, uh, uh, and then, but, uh, and I always sort of went there to fix shit. And then at one point I just went, oh, I, I'm, 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 I'm the thing that needs to do some fixing. So that wasn't the question, but I'm, I'm just, right now I'm just now. trying to buy some sympathy because of the whole date night shit. So <laughs> <laughs> I love doing a podcast. You guys are asking the questions that we try to avoid. Thank you. <laughs> Keep coming back. <laughs> well, that's it for today. Zip. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have a question for us, any question, any question, well, 
We'll decide. <laughs> well, okay. Or, or perhaps there's a limit to the question. But if you do, submit it to us at either inkbox at sutterinc.com or... Just leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com. <laughs> Sorry, that's the say first that time I've said that. Can you say that without a question? Leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash pi podcast. That was a lot. That's a lot. I know. How are they going to remember that? Speakpipe.com slash pie podcast. I think we got it. <laughs> <laughs>